I'll be talking with all you know, you're talking huge amounts of dollars. So yeah. You um hi, good, good morning. morning. Great it's room, cool. great setup. Good. It's nice. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad. We're in good shape, I think. Yeah, I was getting nervous when we Yeah. No, it's good, it's good. I, I can't answer it really like in March it would have been three years. Yeah. It's I know, kind of I was thinking wild. about that. Three years. Three years. Right. And when we left that last meeting, I mean, nobody knew that we wouldn't be back together because it all shut down so fast. Yeah, this is great. You have a good holiday. Kids okay. Your yeah. daughter's okay. Yeah, Your parents. My, yeah, my parents are fine. We we did not get hit by that big. Um, did you get to Rochester? We did. We left. How did you get back? Well, city hall was closed that last Friday, mm -hmm. so we we decided to leave that Thursday night. Right. So we. Could you get the throughway was clear? It was clear. It was just, it was rainy. So it was, mm -hmm. it was scary because it was rainy, mm -hmm. it was freezing, and then we got there in time. But Ro Rochester really didn't get hit hard. Like Buffalo no, was. Which is unusual because mm -hmm. Rochester usually gets a lot of snow, too. not as much as Buffalo, but a lot. Well, did you have a connection to Rochester? Yeah, my grandparents live there and my aunts. And so every I was in Rochester a lot as a kid. And then yeah. um, when I was an adult, too, because sadly, as they got older. Yep. Oh, you, okay. You, so, That's fine. And it's picking everything that you say yep. up. So. That's fine. Hello, world. You know about my family? I know that you can mute. Oh, we can mute. Because I was logging yep. in on my computer and you're like talking about personal stuff. This, which is what will be mostly is. Uh...
done. All right. Mm -hmm. um, you still going to read this and everything? Okay. So we'll call the meeting to order. And um, before we call the roll, the director's going to read morning. the rules. Good Go morning, all. Uh, we are going to have our very first hybrid commission meeting. So new year, new tech. We're really excited about this. It is a soft launch, so we anticipate that we'll be working through some um, technical issues, possibly um, just get it to, to the format again. Uh, but without further ado, I will read the preamble for those who are joining online. In compliance with notification requirements of Ohio's open meeting law and section 101.021 of the codified ordinances of Cleveland, Ohio, 1976, notice of this meeting has been publicly posted. All boards and commissions under the purview of the city planning department conducts its meetings according to Robert's rules of order. Actions during the meeting will be taken by voice vote. Abstentions from any vote due to a conflict of interest should be stated for the record prior to the taking of any vote. In order to ensure that everyone participating in the meeting has the opportunity to be heard, we ask that you use the raise hand feature before asking a question or making a comment. The raise hand feature can be found in the participants panel on the desktop and on the mobile version activated by clicking the hand icon. Please wait for the chair or facilitator to recognize you and be sure to unmute and announce yourself before you speak. When finished speaking, please lower your hand by clicking on the raise hand icon again and mute your microphone. We will also be utilizing the chat feature to communicate with participants. The chat feature can be activated by clicking the chat button located on the bottom of the WebEx screen. Calling users can unmute by using star six. All meeting activity is being recorded via the WebEx platform. These proceedings are also being live streamed via YouTube. All requests to speak on a particular matter via our website and email have been considered. We have also received emails from those who have provided written comments on a particular matter. <laughs> Okay, uh, Michael, you want to call the roll? Anthony. Present. Downing. Present. Luther. Curry. Present. McCray Scott. Present. Sherry Reed Clark. Present. Slight. Present. Okay. You got Marika, she's present. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, before we start, I first want to give a big thank you and shout out to the staff and the team for getting us here. It's been close to three years since we've been in person. Uh, and uh, I have personally missed it. Um, and so, um, and I think one of the good outcomes, if there is such a thing from COVID, is the fact that uh, we did make this switch to um, an online platform, which allows uh, these meetings to be streamed and more people to have access and to make public comment. And I, so I want to really recognize the fact that now that we're coming back, that we would remain uh, this accessible uh, to the community and, and that these meetings will be both in person and live uh, streamed on YouTube. So it's a, actually a really good outcome um, because I think the hallmark of the commission has been to allow as much public access and public comment and um, and uh, and also to move the work along of this, the good work of the city and those that are doing business um, as efficiently as possible. So this is really extraordinary. I also really want to say that I love the new room. First time in here for me. Um, it's much, much better. So so thank you. Um, first, we're going to uh, approve the minutes from the previous meeting and ask that uh, hopefully everyone had a chance to look at them if there are any um, changes or comments to those. Otherwise, we'll entertain a motion. I move approval, Madam Chair. Second. Uh, we have a motion and a second. Uh, can you call the roll, Michael? Yes. Um, yes. Curry. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, motion carries. We have successfully completed our first hybrid uh, <laughs> vote. It worked. So, yay. Thank you. Um, the first item is a zoning map amendment, um, and I'm going to uh, read the ordinance, and then I'm going to read the rules for zoning matters, 
uh, which are a public hearing. The first one is ordinance, it's unnumbered ordinance, changing the use, height, and area districts of parcels of land south of Superior between 111th Street and 112th Street. Um, for zoning matters or public hearing, um, I just want to state for both online and here in person that staff starts with a presentation of the matters and answers commission members' questions. Uh, then we take sponsor testimony if there is any. That could be the council person or um, those whose properties are being rezoned. Um, we do also allow for public comment. Uh, we will take those who are in favor of um, proponents and then those who are, who are opposed to the zoning changes can speak. Um, we ask that before you speak, um, and here I'll just manage who online would like to speak or who in person would like to speak, um, but we'll ask that you clearly state your organization, your name and address for the record. If you're, if you're an affected property owner. Um, and we ask that you keep your comments to two minutes or less, which we will manage. So with that, um, we're gonna ask that staff, it looks like Xavier Bay is gonna present the first item. And thank you, and it's good to see you here today. Hey, thank you. So my name is Xavier Bay, um, Senior Assistant zone, uh, City Planner in the Zoning Section of the City Planning Department. And so, yeah, today we're going to talk about uh, giving the presentation for the net change 2662. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, as you just stated, uh, the proposal is to change the use area and height districts of parcels of land south of Superior Avenue between uh, East 111th Street and East 112th Street. And so, the purposes of this is uh, one, to allow uh, CHN and Eden's uh, life tech or low income housing uh, tax credit development um, to allow different housing typologies. And also to uh, consolidate some of these zoning districts that this is a uh, that this proposed development is happening on. Uh, next slide, please. So here's just an image to give you Cleveland context, uh, located in Ward Nine, and uh, the uh, prospected uh, property owner is online too, and they uh, have consent from the councilman, uh, Campbell. Next slide, please. So here's an image just to show you some of the current zoning. Um, where the, there is currently an urban overlay, an urban form overlay right there fronting Superior Avenue. Uh, and then so right, uh, districts are changing right here, local retail business and two families. Uh, next slide, please. So here's an aerial view from Google Earth to kind of just give you a snapshot of what the neighborhood looks like uh, right there, uh, southeast facing. Uh, so next slide, please. Here's some of the street views, uh, so you can see kind of like the existing context right along the street. So the, the top image there is right where uh, uh, we're, do, we're doing the zoning change, right, uh, Superior and East 11th Street, Southeast View. The bottom image there is just, you know, a step back, just kind of showing you what, what else is kind of happening on that corridor as you're getting up to that point. Next slide, please. And so this is going up. Uh, East 12th Street along, uh, you know, right around the corner there from Superior, just kind of showing you what, what the other side of that block looks like uh, that the zoning change is happening on. North West View. Uh, next slide, please. And so this is uh, right on the other side of uh, the, this parcel, right, facing uh, Northeast, on East 11th Street. So kind of, you know, just kind of showing you all sides of, of the, the plots, of the plots of this zoning district that we're changing. Uh, next slide, please. And so, yep, uh, this is pretty much the proposed zoning change, right? So we're going from local retail to limited limited retail business. And so, uh, really, you can see that the main thing that we are adding on is that parcel right to the south, um, those two parcels right to the south, uh, fronting East 11th Street. Those that we're pretty much adding because those are currently two families. And so this is all going to be changed to limited retail. Next slide, please. So this is the proposed development from uh, CGN Eden, and so it kind of gives, just kind of you know showing you the, the location of you know uh, this is this is some of the some of the exact uh, reasoning behind zoning change. Next slide, please. And yeah, that, that's just it. Uh, it's changing these uh, zoning districts, really trying to consolidate these so that there's no split zoning uh, when the when this proposed development does go through. I do want to uh, just mention that. Before this actually does happen, it will come before 
uh, this uh, the city planning commission um, so, so that it could actually get you know go through design review and all that jazz. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is there uh, anyone here from the sponsor you said is online or the council person right, who would like to speak um, to the matter first? We don't need that, but if there is, um, I see is is the sponsor Jillian uh, Watson or Watson? Yes, if you'd like to go ahead online um, and uh, speak to the matter. Uh, you are on mute, I think. We can't hear you. First place. There we go. Now there we go. go. Okay. Great. Good morning. My name is Jillian Watson Esposito. I work in real estate development at CHN Housing Partners. Um, through the chair to the commission, thank you for your time this morning and for allowing us the opportunity to comment on this proposed rezoning. CHN Housing Partners is supportive of this rezoning proposal. In partnership with Eden, we will be submitting an application to the Ohio Housing Finance Agency to develop affordable multifamily housing for seniors and senior veterans on a portion of the site. The zoning change to limited retail business will allow this transformative project to move forward, which will provide housing density and support services on a high frequency transit corridor. We appreciate the Planning Commission's consideration of this request, and we're happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so now I'll say, is anyone else who uh, online or here would like to speak in favor of this zoning change? Uh, just raise your hand. I see it, Brian, um, if you would like to state your name and address and go ahead and speak in favor. Great, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Good morning, Commission members. Madam Chair, uh, I am Brian Grambort from the architecture firm Heedy, DeFrancisco, and Siebold. Our address is 1939 West 25th Street here in Cleveland. We are a member of this development's design team and like to take this opportunity to express our support for this proposal. At the local neighborhood scale, uh, the rezoning of these parcels um, along the Superior Avenue <laughs> Corridor is really to help the realize the intent of the zoning. The proposed limited retail zoning uh, would be established to accommodate this planned redevelopment and reinvestment in this neighborhood uh, while still permitting uses of land and buildings to those compatible with the district's emerging character and urban form overlay district. On a more regional scale, I think the rezoning is proposed to allow the development of much needed affordable senior housing. Uh, you know, dev developments like this support the low income senior population in our society, uh, while also providing greater opportunities to be interconnected to cities amenities and the public transportation, as uh, Jillian mentioned. So uh, thank you very much. And we appreciate your consideration on this matter. OK, thank you very much. Anyone else who would like to speak in favor of the zoning change? Uh, I see Richard Carr. Uh, Richard, uh, you must be on mute or we can't hear you. Uh, thoughts? Hello, can you hear me? Now we can, yes. Okay, thank you so much uh, for allowing us the opportunity to re request a zoning change to this particular parcel. Um, we support this application uh, for this change. Uh, we continue to, uh, as members of the Housing First Initiative, <laughs> recognize the significant need for this type of development in the city of Cleveland. Uh, we uh, have experienced a tremendous need for housing for seniors um, with mental health and other disabilities uh, who are experiencing homelessness. The need is chronic and continues to grow in the city. And this development will, will house those individuals, which will include uh, 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 half the building will be uh, leased to veterans. Um, and so it's a much needed development. And so therefore we support the zoning change and thank you for your time. Uh, thank you very much. Um, anyone else in favor? Um, now, anybody opposed to the zoning change who, who, or has a question? Um, okay, I don't see anything. So I'll close the public portion and open up for comments uh, or questions by commission members. 
I move approval, Madam Chair. I second. McCray Scott. Motion and a second. Um, let's call the roll. Anthony. Yes. Downing. Yes. Curry. Yes. McCray Scott. Yes. Sheehan Clark. Yes. Clark. Yes. Motion carries. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the second item is also a zoning uh, matter. It is changing the use area and height districts of parcels of land east of East 55th Street between Hawthorne and Central. And Shannon, I think you're going to present this one, correct? Yeah. Oh, there you go. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. So thank you. On this side. Yes. Now. <laughs> yeah. And it's crazy to think it's been three years, right? <laughs> yes. I think March 4th was our last um, I know. presentation in front of you guys for a different rezoning. So in 2020. Um, anyways, next slide, please. Uh, so the proposal here uh, is really to consolidate a variety of zoning districts, uh, really to remedy a provincial split zoning and some lots of consolidated. Uh, it's also to permit the redevelopment of the long vacant Goodwill building uh, along East 55th into a chicken uh, processing plant in line with the citywide comp plan as it relates to adaptively reusing uh, vacant buildings and providing good jobs mm -hmm. for the community. And then to also provide to promote and provide a variety of new job types within the central neighborhood. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and so here's the proposed rezoning uh, here where the Goodwill building is at the corner of East 55th and Central. Uh, many of you are aware that it's long been vacant. Uh, there's quite a few mm -hmm. uh, empty parcels here. It's a mix of zoning. Uh, and then to the north is the old Tom Page Catering Building that is now being used uh, as a SNAP uh, foods distribution and um, processing, if you will, type plan. Uh, next slide. So the current zoning is a mix of general retail, uh, parking, uh, and multifamily. Uh, they are also have already been cleared for uh, vacating some streets and then also um, making Hawthorne to the north, which is also south of the, uh, the uh, new uh, Cleveland Police Department's uh, horse mounted stables um, also. Uh, next slide, please. And so this is just giving you some overview of what the area looks like. Um, it's just a mix of different types of uses here uh, with some residential. Most of the residential is to the south, uh, east as well as the southwest. Uh, next slide, please. Here again is just some existing context pictures, uh, if you will. You're looking uh, north to East 55th on the top photo. Uh, to the south is a picture of the, uh, looking at the Goodwill building as if you were standing right in front of it on East 55th. Uh, and then the other is from looking at it from the rear along Hawthorne to the rear of both buildings. Next slide, please. Again, just some context photos, uh, the view uh, west of East 55th at the rear of the Goodwill building. As you can see, there's some overgrowth. Um, there are some existing bays that are working in favor of this project. Um, there's a view west on Central. Uh, there's also a view east from East 55th down Hawthorne. Um, as you can see, adding, you know, re, um, re-establishing this building and adding some parking would be do a great deal for the SNAP building. Uh, next slide, please. And so this is the project proposal. It'll come back before you all again for design review. Um, they're proposing to use, re, uh, adapt and reuse the Goodwill building as well as add an extension. Um, they're also going to continue to use the existing SNAP building. The SNAP building is a partnership uh, with the chicken processing plant um, as it relates to uh, a larger project um, and getting financed through the federal government. Um, and this is really what they are proposing um, as it currently stands uh, with the project. Um, and so there was a lot of concerns um, initially about like the truck traffic and how that relates to the residential nearby. Um, and so the previous site plan wasn't really conducive to being respectful of the um, residential nearby. And I think that this by opening up Hawthorne and making it two way um, and then really working with the project applicant as it relates to how often trucks are coming through the area. Um, and then the other reason why they also had some site constraints is because uh, they have to bring chickens in one way and take cooked chickens out another way. Um, and so that also lends to like the site constraints um, here. Uh, next slide. And so the proposal here is semi-industry. 
Uh, and that's really just so that they can move forward with their project, get the zoning entitlements they need for financing, um, as well as to be able to reuse uh, this old building that's long been vacant and also bring some re really um, decent jobs to the neighborhood. Thank you. Do you know how many jobs will be created? I'm going to defer to the applicant that is probably online or um, okay. to uh, Director Wong. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll have the director, excuse me, I'll have the applicant share the number of jobs, but I did want to share the administration is supportive of this particular project. Um, you know, outside of the zoning matter itself, it is an Asian and Latino owned MBE business and the the um, the jobs are living wage um, and above living wage jobs or okay. at least living wage jobs to say that. So, um, so overall, we are we are supportive of as is the council. Okay. As is the council person. Uh, is the applicant online or in person? Do we know? Is it Jason? Okay. Jason, if you could please state your name and address. Hey, uh, and, Jason Shimon, uh, 2295 East 55th Street. Uh, with regards to the jobs that will be created, uh, we're projecting around 220 jobs being created mm -hmm. in this facility. Okay. Uh, anything else you'd like to state uh, about the matter? Um, just that we're really excited about it and appreciate your consideration here. Uh, we've already made quite a few strides with SNAP Gourmet Foods and creating jobs there and uh, excited about uh, continuing that process. Okay, thank you. Uh, and Shannon, I assume the council person is supportive yeah, as well? Yeah, Councilman Starr, this has been worked by, uh, is sent in a letter of support. We've been working hand in hand with Nicole, um, Dr. Nicole Calhoun, who's a planner for this area. And then in addition to that, um, the architect was James Tassic from LBA Architects. Okay. He may be online. Okay. Uh, thank you. Oh, um, there he is, I'm sorry. He's right here <laughs> in this audience. Hello. Uh, um, okay, so anybody else who'd like to speak in favor of the zoning change online or here, just to raise your hand. Um, I don't see anyone. Uh, anyone who's opposed to the zoning change or might have a question also? <clears throat> okay, I'll close the public portion and ask if any um, commission members have any questions or comments. Go I, I, so thank you, Madam Chair. Um, no issues with the rezoning. Um, just something for us, I think, to look at moving forward. I just, I will have a number of questions when this comes back through design review. Um, we all bring kind of our own life experience and uh, this is not one that I thought was going to come up professionally, but I help my friends process their chickens when I'm in Vermont. And uh, it is, <laughs> uh -oh. it is, uh, it is not the, uh, the cleanest uh, activity. And, and I, it surprises me. I mean, historically, you know, we had the stockyards neighborhood uh, which was kind of separated uh, as almost an industrial area. Uh, that's where you brought animals into the city. So be, to kind of keep it away from, homes and if it's the case that we're bringing live animals in uh just the noise the odors the waste that's generated the ability for our uh, sewer system to take that in kind of i i I'll, i'm gonna have a number of questions about the effects for the immediate neighbors and making sure that this isn't going to become some while it's great we, we we need living wage jobs I've, i'm not trying to stand in the way of that but make sure that this isn't be, going to become a nuisance uh, for mm -hmm. the residents of Central who live directly across the street. Um, so uh, more commentary on chicken processing pending. Okay. So, okay. Go well, hold on one second. I, I see Jason wanted to address it. Can I let him go first? Yeah, Anna? that's fine. It's okay. Um, all right, Jason, If you, I think it's okay to allow you to address some of this even before you come back through design review. So go ahead. I appreciate it. It was more so just a clarification. Uh, so we will not be bringing live animals uh, here. This is, it's really just a cooking facility and it can cook anything from chicken to asparagus. So it basically would take like a chicken breast, raw chicken breast filet and turn it into say uh, chicken fajita strips, pre-cooked chicken fajita strips that you'd get at the grocery store. So okay. um, just wanted to make that clear. It's actually a cooking <laughs> facility um, and it can um, cook really anything. So. Let's and, call it a cooking facility. Okay, yeah. So, yes, so now, I that, agree with now that. that, yeah, you should probably <laughs> rename it. Um, so actually question to you then, is this a, it, where will the distribution be for this? Just curious, is this kind of making prepackaged foods? Is it going local? Is this, where's the distribution? 
So uh, it will be uh, both local and then also national. Uh, so it'll tie in with an existing organization that we have uh, in, into our supply chain. Mm -hmm. uh, so part of it is a vertical integration, uh, but then also we will be servicing uh, both local and uh, regional uh, clients as well. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Shannon, did you have more? To add? No, I mean, I had the same concerns growing up in North Carolina, understanding that, you know, <laughs> if there's actual chicken, killing of chickens on site, generally the odors emanate up to 2,500 feet. Right. So I had the same concerns, but no, the chickens are already, and any other food is already, okay. you know. Okay. Any other Can I ask Jake? Jason, I'm just curious, do you anticipate there being any odors just with the cooking? I think I had the similar concerns about the idea of live chickens, but. Yes, uh, so I'm gonna actually uh, pass that on to Phil Hurwitz. Uh, he's also on the call um, and he can maybe speak to uh, some of the uh, filtration systems that we put in place here for the cooking. Well, thank you for your time, Phil Hurwitz, 2295. East 55th Street. Uh, I'll be uh, handling the operations of the facility. In the facility, there will be filtered systems. Every uh, piece of equipment will be filtered uh, before it uh, exits into the environment. Uh, you know, it'll be similar uh, odors to a fried chicken. You know, if you go by your local uh, facility, uh, local KFC type of thing, but we'll have uh, carbon filters that will be maintained throughout uh, throughout production. Uh, you know, it's a cooking facility. If you think uh, the Solon, Ohio, the Nestle facility, uh, that's the type of operation we'll be running. Obviously not to that scale, but uh, we'll be a USDA inspected facility. We have to meet all their requirements and we'll have our own HACCP plan. So everything is uh, controlled uh, food safety wise. Okay. Thank um, you. Thank you very much. Um, Director, I think you had a comment. I, I have a process point just to raise because this rezone to semi-industry and the new construction will be industrial per our code. The commission typically does not um, review industrial construction. So I wanted to raise that point. Okay. Um, yeah, and are you saying that, you know, we could request that it comes back as part of the motion? Um, I... It is in our code. It's in our codified ordinance okay. that it's up to industrial. Okay. So, I mean, we can add that to the commission and I, maybe we, or to, to the, the motion and ask that as, even if we can, as a courtesy, if you might come back with the actual sort of layout and design, would be good. So, um, I have an, another comment um, before we ask for a motion, which is <laughs> that, I mean, I do think that uh, at East 55th and Central, that for me, this, this project makes a lot of sense and it's adjacency both to the food terminal, the access to the freeway opportunity corridor, um, the central kitchen and the kind of emerging, um, I think, uh, strength in this zone around food. Uh, you've got uh, Green City Growers down there. You have a whole host of emerging opportunities around uh, food and food production. Um, that I think is really exciting and that I think actually needs to be better articulated in terms of here and, and the potential for job creation um, and sort of a strength uh, in identity for Opportunity Corridor as well, um, as well as really Carnegie Avenue. So from a, just a 10,000 foot point of view, it uh, since there are not live chickens there, I think it makes a lot of sense um, and um, ha has a lot of synergies also very hyper local as well as what you'll be doing regionally and nationally. So I just wanted to say that and um, that, that it's so great to see this kind of investment. You could build this anywhere um, and probably not have all these hurdles in a kind of um, you know greenfield site. So I wanna thank these applicants for doing a very difficult a task to put parcels together and go through a very cumbersome process to bring living wage jobs to the city. And it is really important and we need more of it. And I hope we'll all collectively work with you. I know the city is to make this happen. So thank you for that. And, um, and that's my last comment. Madam Chair, I'll, I'll move approval and ask that the developer come back and share with us um, their uh, design and 
drawings for the project. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Can I add something? So can you make a second motion? first? And I say, hey, yeah, there you go. And I wanted to add that they come back with a complete sanitation plan because you have the CMHA housing project across the street from that, and they already have a problem with rodents and um, in that area. So it's very important that we understand the sanitation plan for that area. Are you okay adding that? To I you? certainly am. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so we have a motion and a second. Um, any other comments from commission members before we call the roll? Okay, Michael? Anthony? Yes. Downing? Yes. Curry? Yes. McRae Scott? Yes. Shiori Clark? Yes. Clark? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you very much to the applicants, and we'll see you soon. Um, really appreciate the project. Um, we have lot splits and consolidations next. Uh, Permanent parcel number 00326042. Uh, this is at 3405 Clinton Avenue. Um, and we have a Dan McCarthy who will uh, present this. Um, I don't know if, oh, I see Dan on there. Dan, are you prepared to show this or talk it through? Uh, as much as I'll ever be, I guess. Good, do it. Hello. Yeah, so uh, I'm the owner of Dan McCarthy, owner of 3405 Clinton. Um, I am asking for a lot split of the adjacent property. Um, here you can see an overview of um, the house on Clinton, which is 3405 with the double lot off of Vine Court. And I am asking for the lot split of the um, the adjacent property behind 3401 Clinton, which is on its own lot with no yard. And I'm just asking for that lot behind 3401 to be severed off from 3405. So uh, just, it's kind of hard to see from what we have. All right, well, yeah. well, well what we end up with is two regular rectangular lots then instead of a more of a flag? So 3405, the uh, house will be a full lot from Clinton to Vine Court. Oh, there you go. You Thank can you. See I the, got it. The, yeah, sorry. Um, the yellow line that's highlighted is the line that would be added. So 3405 would become a, you know, still a single family unit from Clinton all the way to Vine Court. It has a garage on Vine Court as well. That's what the structure is that you see. And parcel B, which is just to the right of the highlighted yellow line, would be its own uh, rectangular lot on its own. Mm. Currently, okay. it would it would not be part of the house. You know that that was something that was done. I I don't know the year, but I don't I don't know the story behind that other than some family strife, I guess. But uh, at the present moment, after the lot split, parcel B would be its own lot. It would not be part of 3401 uh, Clinton Avenue. Got it, okay. Any other questions or clarification? Commission members? Uh, Do you wanna raise that we received two letters for this particular project, um, one from Councilman McCormick and also one from Ohio City Inc., both of whom express concern and do not support the lot split mm -hmm. primarily because uh you know drawing the, the their reasoning is drawing from three section 309.26 uh, their concern is that this will be a substandard lot so just for your study and consideration um the staff i, I think are um not complete consensus but we we shannon may be able to comment from a zoning perspective um, our conjecture, um, not yet confirmed, is that uh, should this be split, there would need to be uh, an additional firewall as well as um, no windows um, facing that garage um, should there uh, you know, be a, a new development there. So uh, Shannon, do you want to comment about the, the zoning or anything else about the lot split? Yeah, I think um, they do the lot split that way. If they consolidate with the house to the north, then they would create a regular lot and they wouldn't need to be here. 
uh, because it would be a standard lot. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. And I think Ohio City and the Councilmen are you know, really concerned where we're splitting off backyards. Um, and so we're taking a flag lot and then creating an additional uh, lot south of the building. Uh, you know, obviously, most likely for another home or a unit. Uh, and if that's the case, there's two different things here. On your lot on the left, that's the flag lot. The garage is sitting directly on the lot line. Uh, and so any unit back that's on that southern parcel that they're trying to create is going to create some type of, you'll have interior uh, side yard issues, which is what the director is referring to as needing some type of firewall, um, some extra fire rating that the building and housing department is going to require if you were to put a unit there. Um, now, if they were to subdivide this lot and consolidate it with the house, then they would be creating a standard lot, which would be in character with you know most of the street. If that makes sense. It would be easier to point it out. I believe Dan has his hand raised. Uh, okay, Dan. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, so obviously, the home to the north, you know, Again, I'm, I'm, this is also a learning experience for me, but at the end of the day, I have no, you know, they've, they've clearly had interest in purchasing the lot, but, you know, we're also, you know, that's, that's up to them to purchase it. I mean, I, I'm doing this for, you know, protecting myself and obviously having future options. So, you know, I could sell it, sure, but that's kind of up to them to buy it. I have nothing to do with. I'm not going to donate it. So at the end of the day, I um, I would like to almost get a good reasoning as to why me, you know, giving it to that address, I I don't have any control over that. Um. Yes, I understand that. I, I mean. Um... I understand that. Um, thank you. I mean, uh, just going to state before we, we normally do not do lot splits without a proposal and an understanding of what is actually taking place. Um, and so I think the concern here is, um, especially when they're substandard lots, um, it is really important, especially with adjacent property owners, that we understand what is being proposed, which we don't have here. Um, so to commission members, I would say that you know, there are multiple options for us to think about, including tabling this, because um, I, you know I'm always hesitant about uh, these lot splits and consolidations without clear understanding of what is going on or what is being proposed as a policy, not particularly even towards this proposal or how the community feels. Um, so. Um, that is really my major concern at this moment. Did we hear absolutely? Any opponent? Oh, we don't do it on lot splits. Okay. But if anybody else would like to speak, I, you know, in addition, would ask that you would. Um, I do see a, someone named Alex as well. Just please state your name and address. Um, yes. Good morning, Chair, uh, Chairwoman. My name is Alex Frondorf. I live directly across the street at three three zero zero Clinton Avenue. Um, I am opposed to this lot split. Uh, for the same reasons that have been articulated, so I will be very brief about it, but I would like to reiterate, uh, Madam Chair, you uh, you hit on the point that there's no clear understanding of the purpose of the lot split. There is also no clear uh, evidence which this board could, or the commission could comply with section 309.26, which requires for a substandard lot that the commission first determine that the resulting lots will be similar in area and lots and width to lots which are common in the immediate vicinity. There's no evidence this morning that has been presented that would allow this commission to make a ruling that this lot would be common or in, in common with other similar lots. Um, it's a non-conforming lot. Um, the, uh, the councilman and the CDC, Ohio City Inc. have both opposed it for very similar reasons. Um, and there is also the purpose of the lot split could be to allow development that would not otherwise be permitted as a matter of right under the Cleveland zoning code. And so we're very concerned with what will go here if it creates a whole new two family district. Um, if, if it would be joined with the North property 3401 Clinton, I don't think there'd be any objection to that because it would create um, a standard lot, a historically standard lot 
uh, but we don't believe that that's the purpose here. I have spoken to the owner, Jose, uh, who owns 3401 Clinton. He is interested in purchasing the lot, uh, but I understand that there's a great uh, gulf between uh, Dan's asking price and what Jose feels is a reasonable price to pay for essentially uh, his backyard. Um, I have no further comments, but for the reasons stated and the reasons, Madam Chair, that you've stated, um, I am opposed to this lot split at this time. Okay. Thank you very much. Anybody else who'd like to speak to this matter? Um, Dan, I see your heart hand raised again. It was actually more of a question. So <clears throat> obviously me saying that I'll sit on it for 30 years isn't going to be you know, an acceptable, an acceptable reasoning to do the lot split, of course. But um, am I am I hearing that I can bring a plan for the uh, for parcel B that is other than just keeping it sitting on it would be acceptable um, if I brought it to Ohio City or the councilman or whatnot and go through those channels before I ask for a lot split. I mean, I cannot answer that. I was stating that we do not approve lot splits without a plan. So um, we, for the most part, we do not, unless it's okay. just a backyard. Um, it, as, a, as a matter of, of process or policy, um, we need to understand what's being proposed and it has to go through a process. Um, so, um, okay, so let's close the Again. public forum. Um, I'm going to close the public portion and ask uh, commission members for any other questions or comments. I'd like to move to table until we have a specific uh, development plan. And I'll second. Okay, Scott. Any other comments or questions? Okay. Um, we have a motion and a second. Can we call the roll? Anthony. Yes. Downey. Yes. Curry. Yes. Scott. Yes. Clark. Yes. Right. Yes. Uh, motion carries. So it's tabled. Um, you can come back uh, when you are ready. Um, and I suggest that you uh, potentially meet with the councilman, the CDC, or the staff and really kind of work through the process. So thank you. Madam Chair, I see Carl Burgess from Landmarks has his hand raised. I just want to make a quick note of this. This is in the Landmarks District, so we would have to do any review. Okay. Okay. Good. Okay. Well, you'll, they'll be back. To multiple places. So there you go. Um, okay, next item Thank is you. Uh, uh, design review Northeast 2022 032. This is the Hitchcock Center for Women New Construction. This is seeking schematic approval, and this is at 1227 Ansel Road. Uh, Brian is here for Maroos, and anybody else, either online or here, um, I'm going to swear you in. Uh, before you speak, um, I'd ask that commission members look at the recommendations. Uh, it was approved, um, but it had some recommendations, not conditions, but take a look at these recommendations as they present. We'll ask if they address them. So, Brian, are you online? Is there a Brian? We know. <laughs> Um, okay, one more call. We might have to uh, postpone this maybe to later in the agenda since there's no one here to speak to it. Um, Brian from Maroos, it might be because we're moving so um, expeditiously yes, through the agenda. Right. So we'll keep going and then um, see at the end. If not, we'll probably have to table it if no one shows up. Okay, Near West Design Review. This is 2022-044 Lincoln Heights development. This is also seeking schematic approval at 1850 Brebier Avenue. And I see Brandon is gonna speak to this from Geis. Um, also, this did receive schematic approval with a condition that is on the screen. Um, Brian, uh, Brandon, are you here? I am. Okay. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth as you shall answer to the penalty of perjury? I do, and uh, we also have presenters, uh, Brad Nosen, Hannah Cohen, and uh, Pat uh, uh, Thornton from Six Mile. Okay, can they also uh, give me an a, a, aye? Aye. 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 Okay, you're officially sworn in to speak the truth. Go ahead, Brandon. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Happy New Year. Um, 
excited to soon be in that room with y'all. Um, so appreciate the, the, the new method here. Um, our project uh, is going through conceptual approval and also uh, schematic approval at the design review level. Um, we've held a significant amount of community meetings. Uh, we've attended three block club meetings. Uh, we've done two sets of uh, individual interest groups selectively to concentrated uh, neighboring developments uh, or neighboring streets to concentrate the discussion of the development and impact of our proposal here to those individual areas. Uh, and uh, now are coming to planning to, to further discussion. So the project's located in Lincoln Heights. Uh, it's located towards a, a lot of large developments that are occurring and growing in that area. Um, I don't know if you want to go to the next slide. Uh, so the site is outlined in the white dashing here. It's currently a open vacant land. It was formerly through the history uh, industrial parcel. Um, it's basically a filled ravine um, there. Trio is near complete uh, on West 25th, a uh, large apartment complex. The West 20th project was approved last year and is awaiting uh, final financing. Um, and uh, the site here uh, is between that and the Lincoln uh, off of Brisbane and with access to Lamoille Court. Um, next slide. So those are some of the developments uh, that have occurred in the direct vicinity of this project. Uh, next slide. Um, we included the Reaching for the Heights, uh, Link, uh, Lincoln Heights uh, master plan. Uh, the, the master plan for the site always had contemplation of a large green space park area uh, located number nine, number eight, a large amount of concentrated town hall. Lastly, um, the large amount or uh, an apartment building uh, on the northern cor uh, section. Um, the master plan also configured or uh, contemplated a, a, a Brevere extension and a further connection to the neighborhood. Um, so all these uh, items are kind of being integrated into this project. Next slide. Here's the overall site context plan. Uh, again, uh, 21 story town, 21 uh, townhomes uh, with 107 unit uh, five story apartment complex and then a 1.15 acre park and green space associated to the project. And then a connection drive, a private connection drive, uh, which will not be gated. It's just private from a perspective. It won't be rededicated to public right of way, but uh, that drive uh, will be fully open. Uh, and this development is not planned to be gated, um, but it'll be a connection from Prevere to uh, Lamoille. Uh, next slide's a little bit detailed, more detailed version, at least blown up. Apologize for the rotation, but um, uh, as mentioned, about 100,000 square foot apartment building, uh, 21 townhomes, various size, um, and then uh, the 1.15 acre park. Uh, next slide. Here's some imagery of the park. Uh, one of the comments on the uh, design review was a condition place that we needed to further develop the park. Uh, we're fully aware of that and agree with that statement. Uh, the reason that the park has not been fully developed or designed was we were working through some aspects of uh, funding mechanisms, uh, grant opportunities and uh, creative measures to be able to allocate cost and, and budget to create this park. Um, and then lastly, we wanted to ensure that we fully had the defined boundary of the park before we started releasing resources uh, and landscape architecture and other design sources towards uh, laying out and designing a park that uh, was not defined. So now that uh, we're here for schematic, the purpose is obviously to lock in the footprints of the development and then create uh, the boundary of the park so that uh, it can be fully designed and developed. Um, here's some imagery of that, some unique lighting, uh, natural landscape that is integrated with bioswales and other natural formations with pathways. Um, some, there's a significant amount of topo uh, and topography changes on the, uh, on the site. So the way that the paths can be connected with uh, the hillside uh, addressed as well. And, um, you know, just some imagery of, of what the concepts here, you know, probably, you know, can and, and could be. Um, next slide, I think is an image of uh, what the park area alone is. Again, 1.15 acres, nice long area. Um, with some pathways and, and other aspects. And obviously we fully are committed to designing and further refining uh, this park area. Um, we just wanted to make sure we define that. Um, next slide. There's some uh, uh, concept images of the townhouses and uh, integrations of architecture for the, uh, for the apartment building. Uh, a lot of texture, uh, mixed media of uh, uh, masonry texturing that can be done in, in kind of a corbeling method a stack corbeling method to create some texture on the building and then also similar in the rib panel 
uh, in the segmented metal panel, uh, and then some warmth uh, with some of the veneer woods. And then lastly, there is a connection drive that goes through the building in a tunnel formation. And the idea is, is that above that tunnel, um, it could be a glass structure that kind of emulates a, a break in the mass so that the building doesn't appear as large um, you know, as, as the forms are. Uh, next slide. And then some concepts of, you know, this, the entryways and storefront, there'll be a, a roof deck terrace uh, with a social lounge that opens up with a skyline view. Um, next slide. And then these next few slides, you might want to just kind of flip through, but here's just different views of the massing and the schematic view of the architecture of the building uh, and the orientation of how it mimics in within the build, uh, within the neighborhood uh, and its relationship to the adjacent developments that are occurring. Um, Here's a street view look through that, uh, that drive-through tunnel location um, and the, the glass uh, connection tower. Um, and then some floor plans. There'll be an open parking structure on the uh, left wing so that uh, about 50% of the parking is uh, is is under, under building. Um, next slide. Next slide. And then I'll turn this over to Pat to kind of talk through some of the townhouse uh, aspects as well. Thanks, Brendan. Um, townhouses are three stories plus a roof deck with an entertainment space. Um, they're a mixture. I think you can see in the elevations, we've got a mixture of materials uh, that are complementary to the apartment building. Um, we've established a, a design here that helps to turn the corner at the ends of the buildings because we have, um, you know, we, we've exposed a couple of the ends of these buildings with the with the latest uh, orientation on the site. So if we can go to the next slide, I think the next one. Yeah, so that the first one was a five unit building. This is a this is a four unit. These are the the four four units that are um, uh, matched up uh, parallel in the mid middle of the site. Uh, we do have each of these units broken up individually in, in plain uh, so that we can actually uh, kind of stack these down the hill. We have some significant uh, topographic challenges with this site. So we needed these buildings to, to, we needed each unit to be somewhat individual so that we could kind of slide them uh, down the hill a couple feet at a time. So that's an, that's an example of how that looks uh, with those all oriented in the same direction. And I believe the next slide is a book matched version uh, of the four unit building if we don't have to step those significantly. Uh, next slide, if you could. Oh, it looks like I'm throwing right back to Brandon. I believe this is an old plan. Yeah, this might be an old package. Um, uh, that was, uh, but uh, there were some more slides that we presented to design review. But uh, overall, um, the project was well, very well received from design review. I know that there was a lot of dialogue about ensuring that the development doesn't go forward without the park. Um, the park's an integral part of the project um, and the development team has been committed um, to the fact that uh, the, the lack of detail in the park isn't because of a, a trying to sidestep it. It's just simply trying to um, progress and lock in footprints to be able to further define. So we are completely in agreement with the conditions that were put forth that before final approval can happen, the park has to be fully, fully designed. And uh, since then we've had some dialogue that we're going to create two park plans. Um, one is going to be, I'll call it a base level park plan. Um, that uh, will be what the, what the developers budgets can afford to create this with future add ons possible via fundraising and or grant opportunities. And that once, if those grants are awarded, then there'll be an enhanced plan that also is integrated into that. And the team um, uh, all felt, uh, including Tremont West, felt that that was an appropriate way to continue this uh, project forward. So um, with your approval today, the next focus is obviously gonna be fully detailing and working through the park uh, and bringing the park to the same level uh, toward, as we move towards final. Is the park, who, who will own and maintain the park? So that's still uh, being very much discussed right now. Um, I'll say a lot of things are on the table. Um, the development team is committed to maintaining the park. If that ends up being, there's some um, potentials for 
uh, various different, uh, I'll call it uh, strategic ownership rights to be able to, again, help fund uh, the park itself. But the, it, the worst case scenario, uh, the development team will manage, uh, the, the properties will manage the park, uh, a part of the development. Okay. I think it'll be equally as important when you come back with the plan to actually, we'll need to know that as well before you'd receive final approval. Yep. Um, okay. Uh, commission members, any questions or comments? Chair Curry, if, if I could uh, just share before the commission discusses the project, um, per section 341.051, there is a tree preservation plan that is required um, mm -hmm. for, so, and so I, I'm wondering if the applicant could discuss that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that that presentation that was there was our conceptual uh, plan submission. That was not our our schematic that was presented and approved at, at design review before the holidays. So, uh, in that package included a pre preservation plan. Um, the reality of this site, although it looks like from the aerial, it's heavily green. Uh, there, the, all the trees are at the perimeter edge of the site, and they'll be maintained as best as we can, except for maybe one tree or two trees, I believe. Um, the rest is really just overgrown brush and invasive species. So, um, okay. But we're saying we can. We'll add that to the motion. I see the councilman is on. Um, uh, councilman McCormick, would you like to speak? Madam Chair, thank you so much, and my apologies. I'm uh, on two screens, which is my favorite thing to do. I'm balancing two meetings this morning, but uh, just very quickly, I appreciate the opportunity to speak today, and appreciate the development of our work with the community. Um, you know, supporting all of the background of the history of the plan that the community developed and all that kind of stuff. So um, overall, great. I just, I really want to double down on the committee's recommendation, Madam Chair. And I would ask the commission, um, totally up to you, but my request would be that that recommendation is actually in the, any motion. Um, we have got to get this park right. Um, and again, I, I know the develop, developer and everybody's on the same page. But we, we've got to get the park right. And I, and I think that, in my opinion, as a long retired member of the planning commission, um, <laughs> this is an opportunity for the commission um, to really ensure that, quite frankly, it's a you know great project, but I just want to make sure that um, this this the, not only the green space but also the connection. This is a really really important connection um, between kind of two uh, adjacent but not connected neighborhoods within the Tremont area. So I just I just really want to emphasize how important getting the park and the connections here right is for the long term for the neighborhood and for the city of Cleveland. So once again, um, I would ask, uh, if possible, could the committee's recommendation be a part of any motion moving forward so that by the time it comes to final, uh, that we have a clear understanding that everyone's on the same page with the park. Thank you so much. For the record, uh, Madam Chair, I just wanted to state also that Tremont West Development Corporation did submit a letter of uh, support for this project and that they will work with the applicant on the green space development. Okay. See one more hand raised, Matthew, from our side. From yeah, the Madam Chair, uh, I can just speak briefly. My, my comments were just echoing uh, the councilman's really that, uh, and to clarify, the conversation at the local design review committee. Uh, we occasionally do have inform uh, informational presentations and that was sort of the intent that there would be an informational presentation and discussion to plan the park space and that that feedback would be folded into the final uh, design documents, which would then come through our normal process. So I just wanted to clarify that. Okay, thank you. I also see Donna uh, Gregorius's hand raised. <clears throat> Good morning, uh, members of the commission and Madam Chair. Um, Happy New Year. Thanks for always allowing uh, Tremont West Development Corporation to work with you and applicants. Um, but in that, I know we sent a letter, but I just wanted to double down that, um, you know, it is important that, you know, Tremont West Development Corporation and the community will be asking for both a fully executed community benefits agreement and green space plan prior to final approval of this project and, you know, echoing what Councilman McCormick said, um, but we do want to commend the team for working very closely with the community and really adhering to the reaching Lincoln Heights master plan that was developed very closely with the community that you guys adopted in 2020, 2020 which seems like a lifetime ago. Um, and I wanted to state that we are also working with um, TRIO, the building that is 
adjacent to West 25th Street to create a connectivity point. And that's something that um, just happened today that we agreed that something would happen. So we're working hard and quickly to make this happen so that we don't delay the project. And thank you very much for letting us provide comment. Thank you. Um, I see one more hand raised, Brad Nawson. Yeah. Hi, uh, Madam Chair and um, committee. Uh, thank you for having us. I just I just want to echo uh, from the development side of we're the developer on the um, um, multifamily portion of this project, and then you know effectively the park as well. Um, we've enjoyed working with community, enjoyed working with Tremont West. Um, I just want to echo that we're, we are uh, fully committed to working with the community, Tremont West, and the city to figure out this park because it is a it's a it's half the project, right? So. Um, and it's going to take every a team effort for everybody to pull this off, um, while also keeping the project moving forward. So, but we want to let, let you guys know we're uh, uh, excited about it, and we're happy to uh, work together with everybody as a as a team. So, appreciate okay. it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, we'll just close kind of the public portion now and uh, ask commission members. I know Marika has her hand raised, so we'll start there. Thank you, um, and. Thank you to uh, the team for presenting. I think this is an interesting project um, and excited to see, um, you know, kind of some of this, this area in Lincoln Heights um, sort of getting so much thought and attention. Um, I think I'm, you know, I'm generally uh, supportive of the project with the caveats that have already been stated around green space. Um, I, I think what I would also like to see, I was just, uh, kind of looking at the map and trying to make sure I understand this project because it is sort of a complicated site in terms of um, just street access for just as like a sort of procedural or I don't know proceed just layout issue for the for your um, you know further plans for green space could you also provide um, versions of the plans where the site is aligned with the way that it shows up on the maps i.e like looking north because I, I find it very difficult to even make sure I understand what's going on when all of the actual site plans are oriented a different way. Um, in general, I think along with the um, the public space plan, I would love to see um, more of a sort of an urban site plan as well that shows the connections into existing city streets a bit better and circulation plans of how cars, pedestrians, et cetera, would use this space as well as um, kind of specific circulation thoughts on how the public would be able to access this public park. If we're if we're saying that this actually is going to be a public park um, for public use rather than more of just an amenity space for residents, I'd like to understand better how people are even going to know about it or find out about it because the site doesn't really have, as far as I can tell, um, any major um, sort of street frontage. And so to me, um, you know, making sure that our group is able to understand kind of the connections in from um, just street access. Um, I'd love to, you know, have West 25th Street show up on um, on these plans. And, and I guess my other um, just sort of point of... Uh, interest in terms of thinking about this park is it looks like there's some additional current green space or open space that isn't included in the um, the project site plan right now but I'm just in, uh, spe specifically sort of along West 19th Street and I'm curious if there's any possibility for some of that other land to get incorporated into the green space as well so just some specific thoughts there um, but yeah interested to see this go forward. To, to respond to some of that, those comments, just to get clarity, um, we absolutely can provide a circulation plan that kind of identifies that. Um, just to be clear, based on a lot of the discussion we've had with the residents, the residents have absolutely stressed to ensure that this connection drive for vehicular access is not a connection drive that allows for kind of shortcutting or cut throughs. The intention really was to, um, and I apologize, I skipped that over in the presentation, that it is a two-way drive connection off of Brevere um, into the development, and then it's only a one-way exit out uh, onto Lamoille uh, to kind of further, uh, I'll, I'll call, uh, prevent uh, constant cutting through uh, the neighborhood uh, in that fashion um, from the freeway. So that was something that was uh, really stressed in our community meetings. 
uh, and we've kind of tried to be respectful to that. Um, we are working, as Donna uh, mentioned, um, we were the architects uh, and design builder for the West 20th project. That's the north and then TRIO is the third building. We're working uh, in uh, the West 20th project. They're absolutely happy and hoping for the connection of this park to lead towards West 25th. And then, as Donna mentioned, uh, TRIO is on board as well. So uh, that'll ensure full pedestrian connection from, from West 25th into uh, this park. Um, and obviously, there was a large expansion of Mulkey Court for TRIO um, that has provisions to allow for that uh, extension to potentially happen too in front of West 20th. So provisions are being put in and, and we'll continue to um, respect those and, and, and allow for those uh, in that process. Um, as far as the question about the West 19th, or I'm sorry, the West 19th, uh, there's a bunch of land bank parcels that are associated uh, to the north. Uh, well, I guess plan north on these orientations, but to the, to the, to the, to the west. Um, of this site, uh, it's the development team uh, is not intending um, to uh, pursue the land bank use of those lands and parcels um, due to process and other aspects. Um, they are available; they are there. Um, but uh, I think for for their team, the team, uh, we we don't necessarily feel that it's necessary for the project to go in and, and add those additional spaces um, to the project, but they are there and they could be, you know, continued and added on, um, you know, uh, eventually uh, or, you know, at some point. Um, okay. Thank you. But those are, those are adjacent parcels to the, what's proposed as the current park space, correct? Correct. Yep. Directly correct. Yep. Mm -hmm. Um. Maybe there can be further discussions just with the neighborhood and the team as you develop this. I think there, the exciting thing is there's a lot to still continue to work on and bring back to us before final approval. Um, Councilman has uh, questions, comments. Too. Uh, thank you. Um, to the developer, uh, I'm assuming you all have done some degree of uh, hydrology analysis, soil analysis. Uh, as a part of the uh, engineering of this property, is that is that correct? It's currently being worked on. Uh, we have uh, some adjacent. Um, we have three adjacent geotechnical reports uh, and environmental reports on surrounding sites uh, that abut, and that were partially at one time a part of the assemblage here. Um, so uh, the rest of the due diligence is in process, um, but we're well aware of what uh, this site was and what this site was used for. Um, and, and how that needs to be addressed. Uh, and what is the, thank you, what is the timeline of the kind of that due diligence completion uh, relative to your plan for coming back for conceptual approval? Would you, are you, are you coming back? I guess you're not final. conceptual. Yeah, final. Right. I, I, I'm, I'm wanting to know, uh, go ahead and answer the question and I'll kind of get to what my concern is and why I would like to see those due diligence reports. Um, the reports will be are, are being uh, reviewed, basically engaged right now, uh, and that process will be completed well before we um, come back for final. That's for sure. Um, we can probably summarize some of the bullet points of those items um, when they're when it's finalized. Yeah, and and I would um, as we move towards the motion, mm -hmm. Madam Chair. Actually, I'd like to add to the motion that we receive copies of those due diligence. And this is specifically related uh, to the concerns about the green space. Uh, so if you look at it, I, I deal with a lot of this on the western edge of my neighborhood with natural ravines that go into the Rock River Valley. And, and you can see it on you know, Train Avenue is historically Walworth Run. The reason the road's in bad shape is because that's where water wants to go, but we've uh, you know, built infrastructure on top of it. And in this case, it's, it's easy to surmise that this was a natural ravine that carried water down towards Walworth Run. So it's not that you can't build on top of it, um, but I think it's important that we understand what's beneath the soil as far as what the fill is, but also how water is flowing through the site. And what I don't want to do and what I'm trying to cut off at the pass is some situation where upon deeper understanding of how water courses through the site as runoff subsurface, uh, does that begin to change how the site has to be laid out? And is the consequence of that uh, a reduction of, of, the, of the green space, essentially? Is that, is that the give in order right. to allow the vertical so construction to occur? Space in there. Exactly. Oh, yeah. Okay. Councilman's life, if I can, if I can respond to that, um, I, I obviously, uh, 
development standards require us to, to handle and address stormwater retention on our site. Uh, one of the aspects that we have been talking through, um, you know, in this regards is to kind of uh, potentially we have the ability, which is unique for an urban site, right? To be able to potentially create some of these retention zones naturally integrated within landscaped areas, right? Normally we're all underground attention in these large development projects because uh, we don't have the land area to be able to accommodate some of these more natural um, aspects that can be, um, you know, an enhancement to the park. So that's where some of the discussions on the bioswales and other aspects have been, um, been tossed around at this early juncture to integrate. Um, so I believe, I just want to clarify that the, you're, you're, you're wanting to ensure that we're managing the runoff within our site um, and, and how that's being addressed. I can say that this development will be conforming to EPA standards, um, you know, ensuring that proper methods are being handled and addressed and, a, you know, a, a no action, you know, aspect is being addressed, you know, moving forward. You know, I, I don't know if it's necessarily uh, procedurally correct to be submitting um, environmental reports and other aspects, you know, from a development to, you uh, to, to city, I think that's the developers right in purview as long as they're complying with um, safety standards, EPA standards, uh, and and a no action letter. Well, the, diff the I think what the councilman is saying is that when you said this is that you will likely have to address the stormwater issues in the, in the park, sweat. which means that there will be parts of the park, if not designed properly, that are not usable because they're actually catch basins or even natural ways of doing it. We just want to see that as you do that and design the overall site for stormwater, that it does not limit public accessibility or use of the park. And it's designed that way because we have seen projects that have uh, cash basins that are awful and fenced and you can't go in and yeah. you don't use them and they take up a lot of space and they aren't the greatest thing actually in the end. So mm -hmm. even though they are catching and, water, and, so. And in addition to that, uh, if I could butt in Madam Chair, one, I would I would push back and say that this project's gonna have to get a stormwater permit. So the fact that those the, those analyses would be proprietary is as I, I, I would yeah. push back on that. But my, my you're right on everything you said. My bigger fear, my more nuclear fear is that a, a, a due diligence determines that a portion of the site for whatever reason that we can't determine is just unable to structurally support a foundation or digging and does that cause the vertical construction portions of it to have to shift oh, and yeah. as a result the only thing that could occur the only way to allow the property to go for or the project to go forward is for that one and a half acres or what, whatever it was to have to reduce down proportionally and what what the, what the worst option being we lose the opportunity for really functional green space in order to allow for vertical construction right so if i can if i can just uh, understood completely so uh, to answer the question we absolutely will ensure that we provide our stormwater management plan within the final uh the final presentation to fully you know have that due diligence done and be able to clearly confirm you know how that it you know how that happens totally understand and respect uh, Lillian your your comment there um, as far as the uh, geotechnical information um, worst case scenario based on the information and we're planning for is that we will have to do a fibro compacted uh, geo peers on this project uh, to uh, to address and deal with the fill that's there the buildings will not need to move they will not need to shift um, that that we have confirmed at this at this point uh, in that scenario. Um, the question just is, is how far, how deep do these uh, geo piers need to be dug uh, and then compacted to pro provide appropriate uh, bearing pressure and bearing capacity for. So uh, the due diligence at that point, you know, the, the footprints where they sit, where they reside uh, will be unchanged, uh, unmoved uh, based on this approval and obviously further refinement of how stormwater management will be addressed at final. Madam Chair, mm -hmm. um, I just have a, a, a comment, I guess, to add. Um, I know the plans for the park is in green space are still being developed, and I appreciate, uh, I can't see the full name, I'm sorry, Brandon, um, you guys seem really far away, um, <laughs> noting that there'll be two, two variations. Um, I just want to add, and this, this speaks to Commissioner Mariga's comment about, you know, the fluidity between the private residents and the rest of the community, um, that there is also inclusion around safety and security. Um, and I think that also speaks to being able to clearly articulate that this is open to the community and not just to the residents of what will be the, the uh, apartments and the townhomes. Um, and I know, again, in the uh, park inspiration slide, you show some lighting, but I would like to see some more details just around 
safety and security and how that's being communicated to the community at large as well as to the residents of what will be those uh, particular developments. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, I see, I'm going to say this list for whoever's going to make the motion because I'll add lighting, uh, that we will, uh, in addition to the condition which is stated for a park plan um, that would come back, we've asked for a tree preservation plan, um, a circulation and public access plan, which I'll add your comment for kind of lighting, which would be required anyway and kind of, uh, kind of understanding of access, who has access and safety uh, as part of the circulation plan, and that we would like to see the stormwater strategy um, as it relates to, in the end, what we're going to see for usable park space. Mm -hmm. um, and so those are the items that you're going to need at final approval, unless there's any other additions from, um, so as for a motion with those items on the record as well, you don't need to restate them. Help. I'll move approval of schematic design with those uh, conditions articulated by the chair included in the motion. Do we have a second? Second. Uh, motion and a second. Can we call the roll? Yes. Yes. Down. Yes. Curry. Yes. The Craig Scott. Yes. You don't hear the park. Yes. Why? Yes. Um, so thank you. I know we were uh, hard on you, and but in a good way because this is an important and uh, really great project, and um, it's going to be really a, a kind of a hallmark for um, how the center of this district is. So I hope you take our comments uh, with support for uh, the fact that we want this to be as extraordinary as it could be. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone. Happy New Year. Thank, thank you very much. Year. Appreciate it. Happy thank day. you. Bye bye. Um, quick question before we go to public square. Is uh, Brian here from Maroos? Madam Chair, this is um, Director Huang. Just wanted to comment that the applicant would like to go to PetBot on January 10th and then return on okay. January 20th. So can, let's table this just out of procedure. If I could have a motion to table 2022 I move to table, Madam Chair. And a second. Motion and a second. Can we call the roll? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Hurry. Yeah. Yes. You will hear the buzz. Yes. He stepped out. Uh, okay, motion carried. If it's okay to the director, um, if we could quickly just do the one mandatory referral before, since public square is probably the longer of the two, is that okay? Um, which is really uh, just an ordinance uh, to designate the Sideway Bridge as a Cleveland landmark. Um, so if we could do that fairly quickly, and then we'll spend a good amount. Of time. Good morning, everybody. Carl Benders, Landmark Staff. Uh, very quickly, I want to take this opportunity to introduce Daniel Musson, who is our new Secretary of Landmarks Commission. Welcome. Note for Don. Uh, the new Don. Don to Dan. Don to Dan. So Don to Dan. <laughs> Welcome. Ward 17 resident. Ah. So, uh, no conflict the there. Bridge, uh, was nominated by the Cleveland Landmarks Commission. We're at landmark status on September 8th, 2022. Uh, the city of Cleveland is the owner of the bridge and has consented to the designation in writing, uh, both uh, through Director DeRosa and through the mayor, who supports the designation as well. Um, to note that the designation is for the bridge only and not for the property below, and that is clearly stated in the ordinance because it's we have to tie it as part of our procedure to a parcel of land. So, but it specifically says, but we have uh, Elizabeth Court Murphy from Perspectives here to do the presentation. She has been taking this through the process. Uh, it was added to the National Register as well last year. So, okay. so much. thank you. I'm, I'm Elizabeth Corbin Murphy from Perspectives Architecture. We worked closely with uh, our, our team to investigate the possibility of reusing the sideway bridge and saving it for as a landmark to the i think the original use of the building uh, the original use of the structure and also to 
the destruction of this structure. The bridge was originally built to join the two neighborhoods on both sides of Kin Kinswood Run. And during the Huff riots, it was mysteriously burned. And it did not destroy the bridge, it only destroyed some of the decking. The city closed the bridge and it was included in an NAACP appeal to the Supreme Court and ended up being part of the discrimination lawsuit for education in Cleveland. And it is an extremely important monument. So we're just going to show you here, there's an outline as, as we talked, the outline does not is not included in the entire in the entire of the nomination for landmark status, but it is to give you context. So the originally there had been a wood bridge across, and that bridge did not serve the gully too well because it what required connection. Right now, the RTA owns the, the Kinsman Run, or operates the Kinsman Run below, and they wanted clear span. So the suspension bridge was designed and built to replace the original. This, what, this structure here that you see was actually designed, but rejected because of its connections to the base below. So the, the successful bridge is a suspension bridge, which is this one. This was designed with Roebling parts, and I don't know if you know, but yeah. Roebling parts, the richest Roebling bridge, and the bridge in Cincinnati that connects Ohio and Kentucky is also a Roebling bridge. And the parts on here still reflect the name Roebling. You can see them on the, on the standard parts. So we are offering this 1930s bridge to you as a unique and very, it's the, as far as we know, it's the longest and only suspension bridge that is for pedestrians only in the state of Ohio. We know that there are others, and we're finding them. The more we talk about this, the more people come out saying look at our bridge, but this one is very unique, and it is unique to, there's, a, you can see rollings on that. These are twisted cable, the twisted cable construction. This is, that was a historic photo showing the, the wood, planks or the wooden walkways, which is now what is entirely missing from the bridge. This is the Garden Valley housing project that's on one side of the bridge right now, and the whole entire area is ripe for reuse, redevelopment, reconstruction. There are play fields and all sorts of, we'd love for things to happen in that area. But as Arnold said, we are only asking for approval of the bridge as a Cleveland. Thank you very much. Mr. Members, any questions? So I, there may be somebody online that wants to address more of the civil rights Portion of okay. the bridge. Um, I also see Marika has her hand raised. Marika, do you have a question? Yeah, I just um, just a question about does the designation of this site as a Cleveland landmark would it have any impact on any possible future plans to kind of repair and reopen <laughs> the bridge? Just wondering in terms of historical status if that would um, affect any any future sort of plans in that area to answer that uh, sure <laughs> so so the owner always has control over their property and that doesn't change with status the, the bridge would actually 
probably have a better shot at getting restored because there are an awful lot of entities that are willing to fund projects of landmarks. And since this one is already listed in the National Register, the Cleveland landmark status can only enhance its <laughs> possibilities for restoration and reuse. But as far as the owner is concerned, the owner always has control over the use of their landmarks. Got it. So is it another layer of protection against potential demolition as well? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, any other questions or comments? I move approval. I second. Um, okay. Motion and a second. Can we call the roll? Anthony. Yes. Downey. Yes. Three. Yes. Mr. Yes. Sheila Yes. Clark. Yes. Mike. Yes. Um, is there a um, is there a <coughs> city of Cleveland sort of um, shepherd for this? And I don't mean the designation. I mean for the. <coughs> Madam Chair, this does belong to the capital projects um, uh, suite of real estate. And so we're, we're mindful and aware of the potential plans to, to redevelop the bridge, um, I think, from now. And it's once we receive this landmark status, how do we strategize and how to okay. make a reconnection? Okay. I, I know Burton Belcar has done, along with Chris, there's quite a bit of work. And, and Andrew Sargent has, I thought maybe Andrew Sargent is on. Yeah. Okay. He has already submitted grant applications to the uh, National Trust for Historic Preservation and one, I think, to the National Park Service in order to continue planning on how to restore the property. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, okay, motion carries. Um, last, but certainly not least, is 2022-072, um, uh, which is Public Square uh, Safety and Security Improvements. This is conceptual approval for Public Square. Um, and I think we have Nora. Uh, uh, from Land Studio and Cali, and but anyone else who's here to speak to this, um, I will swear you in. Um, so, Nora, is anyone else besides you speaking to this matter from outside the city? Yes. Yes, so the chair. We have a number of people on our project team, uh, both from the city and on our consultant team. So, um, everybody that um, knows that they need to comply with this portion of the meeting will participate. Okay, so I'm going to swear you all in. So I'll hear, like, uh, just call your name and say I after I do. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth is you shall answer for the penalty of perjury? Yes, Dan okay. Harrison, I. Okay. Mike Shipper, I. Sana Julian, I. Nora Romanoff, I. Okay, uh, four of you. Uh, okay, take it away. Kelly, I'm deferring to you to open. No, go ahead, Nora. Okay, great. Good morning. Happy New Year to everybody on the call. Thanks for having us. Um, we have uh, before you for conceptual approval, the an iteration of public square. Um, thanks to Maurice and Michael, whomever is advancing the slides with me, we'll go through some visuals um, just to give you an idea of where we are with scope and process. Next slide. Great. Uh, for context, obviously, everybody uh, knows the location of Public Square, but just to reiterate, Public Square's position, obviously, to Clevelanders is quite important, and then geographically is the center of the city. Next slide. Um, and as part of the original group plan vision, believe it or not, now uh, 12, almost 13 years ago, uh, the redesign of Public Square actually started in 2002 and was really brought forward with the commitment of the group plan and a significant amount of investment downtown Cleveland um, to not just have bricks and mortar, but the connective tissue of public space is amplified in the civic discussion. Public Square was a part of that. Next slide. 
on the illustrative plan, just to show some of the elements as we all remember what the key design strokes were on the square and as they're used today, um, Public Square after it opened in June of 2016 became central to um, over 400 events a year um, and is widely used not just for programming and participation, but um, to get from point A and point B in our city for pedestrians, bikes, and certainly as central to service management for our partners at RTA. Next slide. Um, and we can, and we joke, but this is one of my favorite slides and just something for the commission um, to keep in mind as we go through the next several slides. Um, you know, Public Square is a beautiful park that's built on top of some of the most complex infrastructure in the city. Um, and as part of the original 2016 plan, the original $13 million actually had to do with uh, impacts to over 20 utility companies, um, data, water, water pollution control, name it. Um, so it's important to keep this in mind as we talk about permeating the square in any way, um, but also just a really um, wonderful gesture to the work that was done as part of that original plan. Next slide. And the technical plan, um, just to show the reinforcement and the complexity of the plan, um, but also where it's important to talk about circulation, pedestrian paths, um, and the hardscape and the ecosystem that was installed as part of the original plan. Next slide. Uh, so as a reminder, because uh, I think it's always good to remember where we started and where we've come, um, this was the plan before we started before demo. Next slide. And then as we opened in 2016, and as the conditions remain today, um, obviously acknowledging the temporary elements that are in the square that we'll talk about today. Next slide. Uh, so timeline, I think it's really important to reinforce um, because so much of the work that we've done with our collaborative team with the City of Cleveland, RTA, the Group Plan Commission, of course, Land Studio, um, that work has continued, even though it doesn't always seem that way. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about timeline and what's happened since we've all been together. Um, Square opened, the temporary elements were installed in 2017. Uh, we worked through a number of coordination efforts with Homeland Services who are on the call with us today as well as a number of divisions and departments within the city who are all also on as partners today. Um, the catalyst was really um, with the onset of the Bib administration and the commitment of $1.5 million towards a permanent solution on Public Square, uh, City Council approval of that process, and then the work that we've done since then with this collaborative team to come to the consensus concept that we'll present today. Next slide. Um, and because some of our designs, there's a, a little bit of a subtlety to the designs, especially as they read online, if anyone's attending virtually, we're really focusing on this central part of Superior, um, just 476 feet, um, but certainly um, central to this discussion as we look between East and West Roadway on Superior, although there are other parts of the scope that I'll go through in the presentation. Next slide. So the original uh, is as it exists out there today, if we can remember without the temporary Jersey barriers, crosswalks and signaling um, is this design. Next slide. Um, which evolved into what we're calling the March 2017 concept when we were first asked to look at what could we do to take temporary elements and make them permanent. And um, whomever has the mouse control, there is a, um, a line of linear bollards there along superior there is the curved curb line that um, mimics the Jersey barriers as the taper on the central part of, of Superior continues. And then we have the signal on the second part of the square. Thank you, that's great. Um, this is also uh, the restoration of sharrows on Superior that were removed when the temporary elements were installed. The sharrows would then be a part of the broader bike circulation process that Callie is focusing so much of her work on, um, but really for our scope today has to do primarily with Superior. Next slide. Uh, and then we all uh, got together uh, again with the onset of this current administration uh, established by weekly meetings to talk about the concept, um, conducted site visits to Public Square, which is always important. Don't make any assumptions, even though we all know the space very well. And then went through a number of design alternatives to come up with the consensus concept. Next slide. 
our working group bears repeating um, and not just on paper, but in person. Um, we have all worked together. Our biweekly meetings are quite large, um, but that's good as we move forward to implementing this concept. I also want to note that I represent today our team um, from field operations. Unfortunately, Veronica Rivera isn't able to join us today. She was the original uh, construction administrator and designer for the square. She has come back to join us, as has our team at Osborne Engineering, represented by Dan Gerson today, and our team at Independence Construction, originally Don Lays. Um, it's so important to the efficiency of the space, to understanding the space, and to the budget um, to have this original team back together. And I also have a particular point of pride in noting that not only are the original firms and organizations involved, but the actual people that built the original park are involved. Um, and that's, again, a really professional and point of pride for all of us to continue to be involved. Next slide. Our design objectives, just because they bear repeating, to address increased concerns from Homeland Services, again, we have our representatives on the call today, to make sure that Superior is um, conducive to special events, which are so important and central to the square. Yes, it has a very practical purpose, and this design really meets that function, but it also needs to work well as a programming area. There is a existing damage on the roadway surface, which we will repair as part of this scope. Making sure that pedestrians have clarity and safety as they move throughout the square with these improvements to restore bicycle circulation on Superior and throughout as part of a broader um, citywide bike plan and then to retain our TA service needs, um, which remain an important priority of the square. Next slide. So just going through some visuals of the current conditions, which we hope to remedy with this scope. Next slide. So again, just for a visual reiteration, this is the March 2017 concept, which we have evolved to the next slide, which takes that linear line of bollards and runs the bollards along the curve of the curb there in the center of Superior, um, has that central crosswalk for clarity, and that crosswalk will now have a tabletop design for a tactile reminder of pedestrian crossing um, for those tra traversing the square north-south, but also for buses as vehicles on Superior moving east-west. Next slide. Uh, this is a just a copy of what we showed before the RT board. We've presented to the RT board um, and worked together with that team um, starting in March of this year. And we were lucky enough to receive approval from the RT board in support of $500,000 towards this end. Mike Shipper's on the call with us today, and I know he'll speak in a bit about RTA's support for this process. Uh, it means a great deal to us to be able to leverage public participation in this part of the square, not only with the commitment of the county and with the city, but also with RTA. Next slide. So our scope in front of the commission today is what follows the barrier removal, the Jersey barriers replaced with a curb. It's very important to us to have design continuity, material continuity, um, so that this space doesn't feel ad hoc as the square was opened now six years ago. We really want that material continuity for a sense of elegance, but also because um, we don't want it to look um, ad hoc, as I mentioned. There's a uh, temporary signal. We want to make sure that's made permanent. We have Commissioner Mavic on the phone with us today to talk about that. Um, the crosswalk, there are yellow temporary crosswalks out there. Today, they'll be made permanent, striping, of course, on Superior, the Bollard installation, and then a consideration of Superior special event closure, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, that has to do with a more formal and easier closure of Superior East and West. Next slide. To go through visuals, the consensus concept again, looking at that central crosswalk, 26 feet across, that raised tabletop design, the realignment of the bollards along the curve, um, bearing in mind that infrastructure slide earlier to understand each of these bollards would be considered individually as they're installed for the reasons of that infrastructure. And then a good note that we received from design review yesterday to also really consider the placement of the bollards east and west, where does that line need to begin and end, which we take to heart. Next slide. Oh, and I did wanna note um, a number of bollards on the center 
um, will be removable for ease of programming load in and load out, um, but would also meet the Homeland Services requirement and security core installation. So going through some elevation um, visuals just to get an idea of where we're looking at Superior Avenue today, that's the built project without the temporary elements. And then next slide, um, the proposed concept with that tabletop crosswalk and the installed bollards. As you can see, the cadence of the bollards allows for ease of circulation for pedestrians, but also provides that visual deterrent as you're crossing. Next slide. The original uh, from Superior again. Next slide. Raised crosswalk. Next slide. Um, this is, I think, just an extra slide that was thrown in to remind everybody of the March 2017 concept. We can move on from this one. And then um, another part of the scope that doesn't get discussed as much is also the perimeter bollards, which will be installed to reinforce some of the uh, home and services requirements. This includes bollards north, south, east, and west. Um, and in the next several slides, we'll just show a visual of what that means, allowing for the additional safety, but also really reinforcing ADA access and pedestrian circulation. So next slide. The elevation in North Ontario. Next slide. See with the inclusion of the bollards and their cadence as well. Next slide. The northeast corner with the fixed bollards. Next slide. Again for the elevation, looking at access and crosswalk points. Next slide. That northwest corner. Next slide. The elevation, just to give you an idea of scale. Next slide. And the southwest corner, we'll pause here for a moment just to um, remind everybody that this is the corner that also houses the, um, the cafe and serves a really practical purpose in that the um, <coughs> entryway to the cafe is also where so many of the facilities and utilities um, vehicles park for service to the square. Um, we also know that there have been a number of casual parkers there. So these bollards will be removable and will allow for a better system policing that area behind the cafe. There is a vault that lives behind the cafe that also houses access points for a number of features on the square utilities and otherwise. So it's important that vehicles are able to park here. It was designed this way. Um, these bollards allow just a greater program of that space um, to ensure that the right vehicles are parking there at the right time. Next slide. That elevation behind the cafe. Next slide. Uh, and then wanted to talk a little bit about materials as we talk about the importance of the bollard, um, that it matches with the original materials palette of the square, but also serves an extremely practical purpose in that this is a type of bollard that allows us a flexible installation. As I mentioned before, it's not going to be a one size fits all installation. So we endeavored to find a bollard spec that matched the square, but also matched our need to install these bollards as required. Next slide. And then in the interest of just showing process, some of the elements that we're considering for that east-west closure on Superior. Um, the first example, the Raptor 4 example, is a shallow install barrier um, that sits just beneath the surface when not in use and when in use, um, has mechanical operation with a manual override. Uh, there's some precedent installation over at the Federal Reserve, and there are other such deterrents that we're looking at currently um, there are temporary elements that are brought in to close Superior East and West, and certainly we want to create a conducive environment for daily traffic and use on the square, but also for ease of program. Um, so this is something that this scope also is considering. Next slide. Uh, that's what I have in terms of visuals. I know we have a number of city partners and collaborative partners on the call, um, and I defer to the team and to the chair. Uh, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, maybe we'll, um, I know some people will want to answer questions across departments, but maybe we'll start. I know that Councilman has some questions and comments. 
So we'll start with those and make this interactive, um, as I'm sure there's a lot to discuss. So, Councilman. Oh, okay. Um, I have a number of things, and some of them I have discussed with staff, um, as so, so they'll be a little redundant for them, um, but just want to get some ideas out there. Um, the first is just trying to understand the scope. Uh, you know, I've, I, I don't want to value engineer important projects, but I also don't want to overspend for the sake of overspending. And, and one thing that kind of caught my eye is the, uh, the perimeter bollards. Uh, what incidents have there been of cars driving onto the square? I guess I, it's, it, we don't have bollards on every single street corner. We can speculate on every worst case scenario, um, but it, I, I walk through Public Square multiple times a week. And aside from the casual parkers on the southwest corner, and it doesn't seem the bollards would even be sufficient to really block that from still occurring. I haven't seen where people have been driving onto Public Square erroneously or something. So I'm wondering if they're really necessary or if this is just uh, something that is increasing our budget. Thank you, Councilman. I would defer to San and Julian to talk about the daily operations and cars. Yes, Councilman, thank you for the question. We have actually had several cases. While it's not been, you know, hundreds of cases, we've had at least three to four cases of vehicle um, entrance through the corners, through the perimeters, through Superior that have caused both significant damage and concern. Um, we've had vehicles that have driven up to the Tom L. Johnson statue. We've had a vehicle that drove in through the corner behind Rebel and came right in and tore up the seating wall um, and got lodged into the seating wall that caused $30,000 worth of damage to the seating wall, plus lodged the vehicle within. We've had vehicles that have come through the perimeter on the north um east corner that pushed the planter straight through into from the corner straight in i would say about 30 feet and while it didn't do specific um dollar value damage had anybody been there it came in at about three in the morning so had anybody pedestrian been there during that time it would have been a critical damage scenario both to human life and could have been disastrous beyond that. So we do see that continue to happen. And the idea here is to ensure that it doesn't happen during the hours when we do have significant amount of pedestrians in the square. Um, and we're following the guidance of uh, Homeland Services in terms of the need above and beyond what we've experienced in terms of real life conditions that have occurred. Thank you. Um, that's useful information. I, I'll just say um, I, I, I wasn't there at two in the morning when that happened, but I do see frequently cars driving down Superior and I'll, I'll put a pin in that. Uh, and, but uh, for a, a moment from now, but switching to the bikes and the Sharrows, um, I'll just, I'm not going to define what adequate infrastructure is right now, but, you know, I spoke with Councilman McCormick this morning to make sure I fully understood his position. We're building the midway. Uh, we are building a circular loop on the west side of, of downtown into Ohio City. There's plans and dreams of the lower deck of Superior, uh, really focusing on bike infrastructure in the central business district. And uh, I can say I ride my bike with two little kids on it. Uh, I'm not, I'm not using your sharrows. Like I'm riding on the sidewalk. And I think that it's naive to think that people are going to use the sharrows coming off of a bike path and going through public square when there's a sidewalk. So I would like to understand more in depth, whether it's Cali or anyone else, what the conversations have been about bike infrastructure through public squares be sharrows, uh, because that's going to be an important point for Councilman McCormick and Council. I can address that. Callie Mertzman, Senior Strategist for Transit and Mobility with the City of Cleveland. Um, we mostly agree um, having that share restored is an important connection in the very short term for confident cyclists that are honestly sometimes going through public square right now without that additional indication to drivers to expect them. But we know that Superior, both east and west of the square, is an important east-west access and access for cyclists of all ages and abilities to come to and through downtown. We've had already one design charrette with RTA to talk about how that midway network 
goes around public square. Also, Nora mentioned the 15 meetings that we had and the eight design alternatives that we looked at. Um, we did this summer sort of push the brakes on the 2017 design to see if there were a way to get a protected separated bikeway through the center. And with all of the needs and the design objectives Norm mentioned, there just isn't space in the existing condition to have that facility come through. We are, as an administration, extremely committed to having a separated, low stress, all ages and ability connection from the midways that comes into public square um, toward the west, connecting to the Trace Superior and the north south lakefront, short to core work that's, that's being talked about now as well. So the goal would be to have that um, planned and designed and in place when the Superior Midway opens as well. So there's not that stagger step. But where would that be? Where Where does it likely happen? We are not positive yet, but we've really been looking at different alternatives around the northern half. So, so north of public square, yes. north, like not in the square or even in- Potentially adjacent to the square. So in the northern traffic route along where Key is, that area. Potentially, we're looking at a bunch of different options. Okay. Um, the but it's not going through this, the middle. Right, it can't go through, through the middle. It won't, mm -hmm. that will not be one of the alternatives. Right. We, we did examine those alternatives because we didn't want to make this investment advance this design forward. And Got then it. be like, oh, we wish we had. <laughs> right. Um, I think the councilman's point is well taken, though. It'd be nice to know where that is, um, but I, it's good to hear that you're committed to find it. Uh, there is I, guess, there. I do want to share that, uh, you know, we are, uh, as an administration, committing to do an additional study. And I uh, just want to reiterate that point by Kelly that it will be with our partners. Um, you know, we, we have discussions with RTA, um, and I think there was even a, an initial conversation in December about how to begin studying additional <laughs> bike circulation Got it. around the square. So it, we anticipate it will be concurrent as this moves forward through conceptual to schematic to final. And, and th thank you, Director. And, and my position, just to kind of double down, is that, you know, if you go to any college campus and they call it, they have the cattle paths and finally they pave it across the quad because that's where everyone's going to walk. People are not going to go around the perimeter of public square on their bikes. They will cut through public square, either on the road or on the sidewalk. That's just what they're going to do. And I think it's naive to suggest that we can plan around natural human tendencies and use public dollars to try to correct what we can anticipate is going to be a behavior. So I think, I think we need to have serious conversations about that. And bluntly, I think we need to push back on RTA a little bit about their operations. And that's going to pull me into my third point. And this is my personal perspective. This is not the perspective of Councilman McCormick or Council, um, but you know, I worked for the administration when this project began, and I was told to come to work early on that Monday morning when we were going to close Public Square for the first time because it was going to be traffic chaos. We were already waiting at our phones, made in the call center, and nobody <laughs> called uh, because there had been such good, uh, you know, information on the forefront about how to get around uh, downtown without having Superior in Ontario. There was this perception at the time that closing public square would create traffic chaos and certainly not allowing buses through Superior would compound that chaos even further. And I, I think so many years later, I just wanna push back and say, that has not been the case. And in beyond, if there's any frustration with getting around public square, I believe that it's actually over signalized and people wait at traffic lights in low traffic conditions relative to the center of any other American city and it creates people driving erratically. I can't tell you how many times I've been on the 22 bus on the east side of the square and, and the line changes so the bus can go, but people are still loading. By the time the light, like people are loaded, the light has changed. The light's about to change and someone else comes and knocks on the door. So now we're loading again. And now we've waited three or four traffic light cycles uh, to get through the square when you know, center city Philadelphia has a public square with a big building in the middle of it, and all the cars go around it uh, as a signalized traffic signal and or a traffic circle. And, and I think that, you know, I, I don't personally buy any arguments that causing buses to stick to the perimeter of public square would significantly impede RTA's operations, because I think public square already has designed impedes public square's operations at intermittent closures for special events 
is confusing to riders. So, so I, I, I wish that it were something that were more on the table. Clearly, it's not what's being discussed. Uh, but when we talk about going to, you know, downtown Cincinnati and Fountain Square and they have a Dora, you know, like we limit our ability to fully use Public Square just on a casual day uh, because we have buses coming by and buses drive too fast because they have a green light and a green light means you got to drive faster to make the green light. I just I wish we were going back to the original idea that Mayor Jackson did support of having traffic stick to the perimeter. And I wish we weren't having to expend a lot of money having to repay, re, re, repair pavers because buses have now been stopping in the middle of Public Square because Jersey barriers were put in allegedly for Homeland Security, but I think as a passive aggressive fight between the previous leadership of RTA and the previous city administration. So that is, that is my piece. I have spoke it. Um, and uh, it, it doesn't even need response, but that is that is how I feel. And I think that in a perfect world, we would be taking this exact amount of money or less and using it to put bollards on Superior so that buses no longer go through and we can fully use our downtown public square as designed a, a functional, unified, New England style town square. Mm -hmm. End of soapbox. Okay. Commission members, any other comments or questions? Um, I will note that we are being asked um, for um, conceptual approval of this plan as it moves forward. Um, there is more work to do. There are some conditions that are outlined here um, on um, the, um, the screen uh, for additional um, study as you go forward. Um, I, I would like to just note that um, I'd like to really um, thank the administration, this administration, A, for moving forward in a kind of a two-step process. It really, for me, the idea of the, the, the kind of interim removal of the situation, making it better, but not stopping there and taking the time to work collaboratively with RTA and all the departments required to in land studio to actually uh, take a moment to design this is not perfect. Uh, by any means, but I do like the design uh, from the perspective of um, the simple but thoughtful solution of narrowing um, that moment and raising it up uh, because I think it will work to, um, to send all the right signals about both where to cross and that whether it's buses or otherwise um, of, of having really to slow down and take that moment, which was really the issue, the safety issue before. So, um, and I think this also makes clear to the public that this is not as simple as just removing bollards, which has been the perception that's out there. Um, which, you know, as I've listened to people online talk about it, a kind of misunderstanding of how complex it is and how necessary it is to invest in a solution that's a little bit more long term than just removing bollards. Um, so I think it's really quite nice. Um, it, it is not perfect, but I, I do agree with the councilman on the point that um, as you move forward with this planning is maybe not also to shut the door on what a public square solution might be that might be unusual, that might actually go through the square, not necessarily the street, um, but that isn't, might not. I, just, I, I, will, I will send pictures to you, Madam Chair, but I was in Detroit about two years ago and really impressed in an outer neighborhood of Detroit, like Seven Mile in Livernois, where they uh, just, you know, had one-way cycle tracks De delineated with a different color pavement. And and I think that there's ways to pull bikes through without having to create a 12 foot separate. Also, I think that logic dictates that when you're in the middle of a crowd, you slow down. So, yeah. But. So anyway, so we know you've got work to do. Um, uh, we'll ask commission members for any other comments or, or, or a motion. So I'll oh. move approval. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Well, Excuse you can do a motion me. in a second and she can still uh, ask her question if you want to go ahead or, oh. or either way. Um, <laughs> I'll make a motion to approve with the conditions that are listed um, from uh, design review and I need to read them, right? Um, I think it's okay if they're up there. You may not have to read oh, them, but okay. we're there for the record. Well, all of those uh, as part of the uh, motion. 
Do we have a second before Marika asks her question? Second. Second. Would, have... just, would, would you entertain revise, uh, adding to that an additional, uh, coming back with additional information on the bike infrastructure? Yes, I would um, definitely be willing to do that, Councilman. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Marika? Yeah, I just had a couple of questions. Thanks for the presentation. Um, I agree with Councilman Slife um, on the bike infrastructure question. I have to admit that I am also one of those cyclists that currently cuts through Public Square on the street. And um, while I think Shero's are, you know, better than nothing, um, I, I sort of find it hard to believe that with the amount of pavement on either side of the current bus lanes um, or within those two bus lanes that there is no truly no room for some type of more separated bike area just there's just a lot of room there um uh, just a couple of um sort of specific questions on the ballers um one i guess i'm just trying to understand why the spacing between the bollards seems so different and kind of random i'm assuming there's something around the utilities underneath or something like that um, but um i guess i just was all of the reference images show all bollards that are nicely evenly spaced and i just don't want it to um seem sort of weird and messy if every single bollard is placed at different spacing from each other and then another just question is um the the event barriers that are proposed that look very kind of verging on militaristic to me um curious if there's any possibility to use a similar type of bollard for those types of um, event barriers that in a way that could be removable or retractable or something like that just to kind of uh, streamline the design uh, of the the square in its entirety um and then i also have a similar um just question to councilman's life on the 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 need for all of the perimeter barriers it seems to me i was trying to remember all of the conditions on each corner of the square um you know basically are are you know are those two bollards on the southwest corner actually going to prevent people if they want to from driving into the square similar question for the other areas i guess there's curbs since a lot of those areas but just generally it seems like it is a lot of money for many additional bollards and I'm sort of questioning whether it's actually going to prevent people who really want to from driving into the square adjacent to where those bollards are. Um, so, and I get my last question, just looking at where the, you have the, the sort of bowing in of the, the square or of the crossing. Um, there was a, um, somebody had written a letter with a design alternative that I, assuming that you guys saw um, proposing planters instead of bollards and like sort of adjacent to that central crosswalk, um, which, you know, I, I guess, you know, I would assume that your working group has it probably explored similar options and, you know, opted not to move forward with those. So um, I don't think it needs to be belabored, but I am just wanting to make sure that I'm assuming the curb will be built up there to accommodate to like kind of meet the tabletop because I think there's like right curb cuts um, in different places there but just kind of curious any thoughts on um, the fact that's raised in that letter that having bollards all the way across doesn't necessarily um, encourage people to cross at the crosswalk right people can essentially cross anywhere they want in that central area so um, just any thoughts on that? Thanks. Great, Chair to the Mar to Marika. If I if I don't answer, I I think I wrote everything down. But if I neglect to answer something, just let me know. Um, I, one thing I would just restate is the the scope of this you know current proposal does include a number of items outside of the bollards. So I know when we talk about the budget, a huge part of it, yes, of course, is bollards, but there are other elements. Um, to the cadence and the installation, the placement of the bollards, there's a number of things. Um, one of the benefits of having the project led by a landscape architect is to keep the design um, central. And this is not to ding any of the other partners, but certainly to maintain that original design integrity while also meeting the requirements both engineering and homeland services based of where those bollards need to be, where you see the bollards placed, 
There has been um, a priority put on a regular cadence um, so that it doesn't look mishmash around the square and then therefore sloppy. Um, I would note, and this is a really good note, Marika, from you and from the councilman, um, to show the visuals of why those two bollards in the southwest corner are a deterrent because of the existing infrastructure in the square that includes, um, yes, curbs for sure, poles, planting beds, and other things, which I think create this vernacular of deterrent that is maybe more natural than something um, maybe as obvious as a bollard. So that's a really important visual note for our team to make sure that we convey that in, in our graphics. Um, so uh, bikes needing more room, I would maybe to defer to Callie. Um, being a somewhat bound, but I think in a good way on this current scope of the eight design iterations, we did look at what that hardscape could do to accommodate the bikes. Um, but knowing that the city was going into a broader, bigger plan, the Sharrows were thought to be, let's look at this for now and reinstall or restore those Sharrows to allow um, for there to be something, and Rick, I think you said something is better than nothing, but also to, to know people are like water, and we know that in planning and design, um, that as they go through further bike um, conversations, um, to really think about the square in general as a palette for that infrastructure, that needed infrastructure. Um, other physical deterrents, you mentioned the note that we received on planters. Yes, absolutely. We saw that. It's something that um, we looked at even the original design. Um, and it's funny because there's this notion of more blockage, less blockage, simplicity versus complexity. And really, you know, we have six acres of this installed ecosystem, this beautiful hardscape. Um, and having additional planters there felt um, superfluous in a way that allowed bollards to be more simple. Um, also installation was there um, and also circulation. Just um, we know that the bollards may or may not deter people from crossing, but we are creating all the visual cues, um, the combination of the signal, the centralized crosswalk with um, the compliant um, curb um, to really focus people. But um, we we see people crossing everywhere all the time. So knowing, um, you know, certainly best efforts will never stop the human factor. Um, let me see. Oh, oh, the closure on Superior. Um, you know, I did tip the scale a bit to the Raptor, which is the first spec that was on that consideration matrix because it is less, you know, your word militaristic, but it is less in that it sits, it slides into a shallow um, receiver. It kind of sits just below the surface and then looks really like a surface mount kind of platform. Um, when raised, they do look quite intimidating as you've got, you know, pedestrians who would be on the square on Superior during an event. Um, you know, some of those other three specs are, are um, a little bit um, more obvious, the Raptor has a subtlety to it, which is why we like it. We also like the manual override, which is really important in our weather. Um, and it's why this is up for consideration, because we're really looking at the pros and cons of each of these specs. Um, the idea of the removable bollard um, in and out of the square on Superior is also being considered. We've talked about it. Um, I would defer to our Homeland Services team on the call and or Commissioner Mavic. One of the challenges is it has to meet a security core rating so that the impact of a vehicle obviously is deterred by the bollard. Below this, below the square on Superior there, we have in addition to a 16 and a 30 inch uh, water line, a number, a data line that runs below there and the ability to go to the depths needed for that type of bollard while also having that above surface um, element are somewhat at odds. Um, so, you know, Dan Gerson's on the call, we have engineers on the call. So we've really talked about that. One of the suggestions we always receive is, can you not have a baller that's retractable, goes below ground that we see in other cities? We just don't have that space below Superior. So we're really trying to make the best of it without um, relocating those water lines, which obviously would exceed this this and, and most budgets. So, um, you know, really wanting to reinforced with the commission how much consideration has been given to some of these elements that we're presenting in front of you. Okay. Thank you. Um, the director has a follow-up on this. Yes. Um, so I do want to just share that. Um, I, I do want to respond actually to Councilman Slife's comments. I don't know if now is an appropriate time to do that or if you'd like me to wait until this portion is complete with uh, Mariko's question. 
Should I, should I is it up? is it a different topic? I want to respond to Councilman Slay. But... Oh, okay. Um, I, I, is there anything else uh, on this topic before we move? I, I, well, we have a motion and a second, um, which we can continue the discussion. But um, I'm assuming, Marika, that um, yeah. you're not wanting or you are wanting to add to the motion your since this is conceptual approval, is sort of more, um, I think what I heard you say was kind of more justification if those exterior bollards are even required, right? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think that's, and I, I think it was more of just a clarification. Okay. So um, I don't know, and I guess one just procedural question would be, are we, is the event barrier selection is that something that's not something that we would need to decide on, right? That's just something that is included in this package as part of. Yeah, and I'll come program. back with all of that. Yeah, um, I would. Um, I so we'll ask, but I would, would ask maybe if the councilman or if, uh, Diane, who made the motion, maybe does want to, to suggest here that, that from the commission's perspective, we're obviously sending a signal that depending on who's requiring these corner bollards that we're open to that shifting it when they come back to final from our perspective mm -hmm. um but we'll let that decide if we're going to add that later um okay I'm, I'm happy to make my comments after a roll call since uh, okay yeah I don't know. third comments yeah third okay comments, yeah. um okay so uh we have a motion um and a second and we will see you back here with a lot that you have to work through um so um we'll call the roll Anthony. Yes. Downey. Yes. Curry. Yes. McCray. Yeah. Yes. Shiri Clark. Yes. Slush. No. Um, motion carries on to the director. I, and actually, this was our last item, but we'll continue the discussion a little bit. Yeah, I, I just want to know for the this record. Councilman McCormick has his hand. Oh, oh he yeah. does. Sorry, Councilman McCormick. I apologize. I didn't see your hand. No, uh, uh, Madam Chair, that was uh, my fault. I had to jump off and now I'm back on. It's been a crazy okay. morning. Okay. I just um, I appreciate everyone's work on this. Um, and I forgive me again, I did not hear the presentation. I just want to make sure that we have a cycle solution through the square. To me, that is an absolute must in a order if this moves forward, if that doesn't if that doesn't uh, is not included in this plan. Thank you. OK, we it's in the motion. So, yes, we will. We will see that when they come back for final, uh, what that uh, solution might be. Uh, I, I do want to share that, yes, uh, as a staff, as an administration, uh, Mayor Bibb himself reiterated this need to study bike infrastructure. So we have been in conversations with our partners around that. Um, and, uh, you know, we are very conscientious of this and are committed to making sure this is moving forward. I do want to address quickly, though, um, this notion of the design, uh, you know, someone artfully said this in one of our meetings, but that the RTA in our public transportation system was actually one of the first tenants of public square. And I, I think we, we ought to respect that. Um, it, it is this is such a central part of um, what transportation looks like downtown. And so, you know, from Mayor Bibb himself, um, one of the messages that he shared, as well as our staff, is to say, you know, we do really um, want to honor and um, say that the city is a partner that RTA can trust here. Um, and we've worked on this um, very closely with RTA. Um, and so I do want to say that while uh, the design of the public square, um, you know, had at one time this temporary closure, the original design intent, um, as was scoped, did include public transportation as a part of that. So I, I just wanted to note that on the record, um, and we will continue to take your comments and, and work on this with our partnership, um, with, with our partners on the line. Thank you. Okay. Um, we do have a director's report. Um, yes. We are going to uh, hear that, um, but uh, you're going to have to help me procedurally now. Do we adjourn the meeting and then hear that? No, it's director's report first and then adjourn. Okay. Yes. Uh, first of all, happy new year. So it's great to see you all in 2023. Um, 
I will say that at the end of this, uh, just this director's report, I would like to um, hear feedback on how this hybrid format has worked for us today and how we can make adjustments to improve. Um, we're really excited. We took a look at 2023 and what's ahead. We have major planning efforts coming down the line, including uh, the capital projects led parks and recreation master plan, which the planning staff will be intimately involved in. Uh, we will see the release of an RFP for a mobility plan, a citywide mobility plan, um, considering bike, pedestrian, uh, other aspects of mobility, uh, possibly including transportation. And, and so I, uh, I'm excuse me, public transit. Um, and so we are really excited about these um, planning efforts moving forward with our department. We're also excited about partnering with the uh, Department of Sustainability and the Office of Sustainability on their climate action planning, which will be kicking off uh, this year. And then finally, as I mentioned, December, that uh, in uh, the middle of the year, you can anticipate that we will be releasing uh, an RFP for our citywide plan, um, Cleveland 2040. Um, and it's, it's our intention that this will be a very publicly engaged process where we really work with um, our staff, with you as the commission, with the public, to really unlock our imagination. You know, what, what, is, what is the future of Cleveland look like? What is our collective vision in 2040? Um, for our neighborhoods, for our waterfronts. Um, and so we're really excited about moving forth that with you. Uh, next slide, please. A few project updates. Uh, Thrive 105-93, again, this is a plan that was adopted in uh, 2017 by the commission. Um, design um, is moving forward through the Mayor's Office of Capital Projects. Uh, planning has continued to partner with them to make sure that there is uh, you know, design elements um, that, and public engagement. So actually today is the last day to take the survey. Um, and postcards have been sent to the community members who live along this corridor. Um, and we did have a public engagement in December. Um, and so please, please um, you know, be mindful of this and, and share the word um, to those who are watching. Next slide. Uh, a zoning code update. I would like to present on behalf of the staff a proposed schedule for the townhouse code review. Um, someone from the public did note that there was a difference in the posting period between the townhouse code and then also the small changes zoning code. Um, and the small changes zoning code was, is being posted for 42 days to accommodate the holidays, while the townhouse code was only posted for 30 days. Um, and so we will match that posting. Um, we will you know, say we will have a final extension of up to January 17th at 11.59 p.m. for additional public comment. That does bring us to 42 days of public posting uh, for the townhouse code. Any additional comments may be submitted via email to our general planning address. We do receive all those. We have received at least 10 letters so far. Those will be publicly posted. Um, you may also drop off any handwritten or printed comments here at City Hall in the planning department from 501, or you may leave a phone message. 216-664-2210 is our phone line here at City Planning. After the public comment period, staff will publicly post the final revised code for commission review for, for your own reading. On February 3rd, we will give you two weeks to, to really take in all the comments and revisions, and we intend to bring the final presentation uh, and a vote uh, for February 17th, uh, about a month, now, about six weeks from now. Upon your reading and approval, Staff will send the proposed changes to the law department and on to city council for, for legislative, um, uh, the legislative process. Next slide. I do want to note a reminder that the proposed small changes to the zoning code is posted online. Uh, the public comment period will end on January 31st at 11.59 p.m. This is the final deadline, and I, I want to reemphasize that. Um, Staff will present a schedule at the next meeting on January 20th, 2023 for how this will move forward. Um, we anticipate it will be a very similar uh, timeline. It's primarily because we want to make sure that we work with our colleagues in building and housing um, and making sure that we are integrating all of the comments um, from their end as well. Next slide, please. 
Uh, so with that, just want to see if there's any feedback on the hybrid meeting format. Um, how, how did it go today? Are there any tweaks that you would like to see? Um, perhaps Marika, since you're online, how, how did it feel for you? Any comments from the commission? I thought it felt good. I, I sometimes had a little bit of trouble hearing the roll call, but um, that was about it. <laughs> Very smooth otherwise. I have a slow fight of cold. Sorry about that. I can do better. <laughs> it could be because there's only one speaker, but it's pretty good, but it's way down here yeah. and you have a mask on. So yeah. um, maybe yeah, maybe we slide it down a little more. Yeah. Inside just to it's there's down there. Bit, especially. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, um, I thought it was great. Yeah, it was good, good to be back. Mm -hmm. good. Really, good to yeah. The house. And it's great to be able to have the additional uh, participation. Yeah, you know, yeah. online. Yeah, I like being so. able to see out the window too. It reminds us that there's a there's a okay. world outside yeah. as we sit in our seven hour planning commission meeting. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Got to raise the blind though, yeah, exactly, so we can see what the weather's like. I mean, it's the best of both worlds, and it yes. really opens this up to the community, and people don't have to take a whole day off work if they can't come down here, but they can if they want to too. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, I think it's excellent. So thank you. Good. Great. Congrats. Yeah. Mm -hmm. thank you. Thank so are we back like this now going forward? Is this it? Yeah. I mean, we have one more soft launch meeting and on January 20th. I actually will not be in attendance okay. because I'll be attending the NOACA board meeting. Uh -huh. Okay. So Marie, assistant director, Marie, Mark. Marie, Mark. 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 Assistant director, Mark. Yes. Well, I'm sorry. Mark Fields will be, uh, you know, Presenting okay. over this meeting on January 20th. Uh, we'll be back on February 3rd. Okay. Um, we have some major projects down the pipe, so we're very excited about presenting those and working with you on that. So, okay. Thank you. Okay. Meeting is adjourned. So, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.